Okay, we're gonna get this party started. My name is Cindy Doyle. I'm the Director of Community Relations and Education Foundation for Klein ISD. We welcome you to the 2015-16 Grant Writing Workshop for the Education Foundation. Today, you're going to learn the nuts and bolts about uh, what the foundation expects uh, from their grant applications, and it will be followed up in how to write a grant uh, by Ms. Lynn Dozier. So, to give you a little bit of information about the foundation, it was um, started to basically benefit the staff and students uh, of Klein ISD. We're to generate funds and put those back into the classrooms of the district. It was established in 2000 under the direction of then Superintendent Donald Collins. We have a volunteer board of directors made up of 33 community members of business partners that serve on the board. Their function is to raise money to put it back into the classrooms in Klein ISD, and they do that. Each year they set aside uh, roughly $150,000, $75,000 per semester to put back into those classrooms. In the fall, the uh, Klein ISD Education Foundation Board of Directors awarded $73,505 in grants, and it was, it was quite amazing. Uh, since 2001, when the, fun when the funding started, um, they have given away uh, $1,367,347, $1, and that was in 317 grants. The, uh, also nearly $400,000 in um, professional development, and something that we're very proud of, there's two projects we're extremely proud of, in 2010, they awarded uh, over $30,000 to uh, retrofit the Reading Express bus, and since then, another $5,000 has been donated to uh, rewrap it and to put a new awning on it. So we're very proud of that. Our latest project is the Steam Express. Uh, that's amazing. We have $330,000 invested in the Steam Express, $55,000 in donated technology, and $30,000 in donated uh, design services. So uh, you can see that was a pretty hefty project for the foundation, uh, and it, it took us two years to get there. So. We're very excited about that. One thing that we're also very proud of is that we have over 500 Klein ISD employees who donate to the Education Foundation via payroll deduction. They are part of Team Klein. They donate nearly a thousand, or just a little over a thousand dollars a month uh, to the foundation. So it's pretty exciting. If you if you're not part of it and you wish to, uh, we've got the information for you. So it's it's pretty amazing. One of the things that we've done too is revamp the grant awards. And that was as a result of the Rice University Capstone Project through their graduate school. And, and so the foundation board voted to increase the amounts. Individual teachers can now be awarded up to $2,000 for a grant. Campus or departments, a maximum of $7,500. Multi-campus grants up to $15,000. And um, we also have Lead the Spark grants, which are for principals only, and they write the grants and submit them. Those are for campus-wide projects. Those are up to a maximum of $25,000. Um, all of this information is on our Klein ISD uh, Education Foundation website at kleinisd.net slash KEF. There's also a list of previous grants. If you're looking to see what's been done, what schools have been awarded, things of that nature, how much, the teachers that were involved, all of that is listed all the way back to 2001. One of the things that we want to do uh, as an education foundation is to provide seed money for innovative projects. And what that means is we want to give you at your campus an opportunity or your department or your facility to try something new that's never been done before in Klein. It doesn't have to be new to the world, it just has to be new to Klein ISD. And we provide the seed money if your grant is awarded so that that can be tried. And what that does is it gives your principal and or the district an opportunity to look at it for possible future funding. So if it is something new that's not being done or currently funded, this is a great way to try it, uh, see if it works, and then look at the, the, the funding opportunities there. Um, we want to make sure that, um, that it meets your campus needs. Uh, writing a grant application just for the purpose of writing it is great, but really what our purpose is is to serve the kids. 
And so try to think, what is it that your campus or your department or your classroom really truly needs that you do not currently have access to? And then possibly that's uh, something that you could write a grant about. Um, also peer projects. You have other folks that um, work in other districts possibly even your uh, education department at the university where you graduated uh, may have some ideas for you if you're looking for some grant ideas. Also, a lot of our teachers attend Rice University summer programs. There are a wealth of information uh, that comes out of those programs that may be some ideas that you would wish to write about. Regardless of what your topic is or what you're seeking funding for, the primary objective for the foundation is that it have a strong academic component. Anybody can write a grant for material. We call that a material grab. They're not interested in funding just material. They're, they're interested in the academic component because how are you going to make a difference for the, the students in your classroom or on your campus? So please keep that in mind. Um, we also want to uh, make sure that, um, that it impacts and it states the goals that are relevant to your campus or your district plan. And also, does it have potential for replication in your campus on other grade levels, uh, at other, uh, for your campus as a whole, or even at other campuses? The one thing that we do want to share with you are things to avoid. Uh, these are things that over the years, the foundation directors have decided that are really something that they choose typically not to fund. And that is salaries and fees for speakers, snacks or refreshments, awards and trophies, T-shirts, airfare, hotel, food, travel cost, uh, or applications from multiple uh, groups of teachers on the same campus for one project. The reason for that is those are typically considered one and done. And they're, if, you, if you are seeking funding for one of these items in your grant, where would you get the money to do it again? While sustainability is not a requirement, it does, have, it does add to the strength of your grant if the potential to replicate it or sustain it is built into your application. Again, it's not a requirement. So those are things that, that typically they uh, will not uh, fund. We do have two grant cycles per year. We have one in the fall, which was just awarded in December, and then, of course, the one that's in, in session now. And the deadline is April the 1st, 4.30 p.m. in the Education Foundation offices. And um, the, app, the evaluations will occur. It usually takes about 30 to 45 days from the, the time that the de uh, grant applications close until they're awarded. There are a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, we have to... Um, not only evaluate, the uh, Education Foundation has a grant review committee. Uh, KIC brings in all their program directors to review all of the grant applications. We have to seek sometimes special evaluation for special projects, and we do that. And then it has to go to the Education Foundation board for approval. And then once that is done and um, they're voted on, then they can be awarded. So that's, that's what we do. We have a lot of requests for technology. It could be hardware or software. Uh, all technology purchases uh, must go through the hardware approval process. Now you're saying, I'm writing a grant, I don't have the authority to purchase it, but what you need to do is make sure that technology approves it in the event that your grant is awarded. So what you do is you send a, a recommendation to uh, technology saying we would like to see if this hardware and or software is available for purchase should we be awarded and always always include that you're writing a grant for the education foundation they understand our deadlines and they're working with us to make sure that we get this information back please be advised that bluetooth devices are not allowed anywhere in our district okay so if, if you have a hardware purchase, you go to Kleinet, the form is there, the information is in your uh, packet telling you where to go. Once you receive approval, attach it. The one thing that technology is wonderful about is if you're the a product that you're trying to seek approval for is something that cannot be serviced or uh, sustained in the district, uh, almost always they will suggest an alternate for you. And then that gives you time to look at it, make sure that it was going to work with what your uh, objectives are, and then uh, change your budget so that you can get that information. 
Also, they will let you know if there's something upcoming. We had a grant one time where uh, it was at Wonderlic Intermediate. They were asking for some technology. Uh, our folks knew that there was a brand new product coming out uh, in, the, in the spring. And so they suggested that they wait on the technology component of their grant. And so that, that grant ended up being split. They wrote for part of it in the fall and part of it for the spring. And the spring was based on the brand new technology. They were able to get more bang for their buck and more product. So uh, that's something too that technology will help you with. For software, you will go through the help desk. You will submit a request through Edgeforia for your proposed software. Once you get the um, affirmative, you uh, the email, you attach it to your grant application. So hardware or software, regardless, once you get the uh, affirmation that it is serviceable by technology, always include a copy of that uh, with your grant application. Uh, because if you don't, your grant application is considered incomplete. Okay. If you need additional help, there's a lot of people here to help you. Your grant, uh, campus technology advisor is a great source. Purchasing director, Lisa Turner, she's phenomenal. Uh, Brill received a, a $25,000 grant to transform their library. Lisa worked with them to make sure that they got the furniture that they wanted and um, the, at the best prices and with the, the vendor that could get them actually more than they actually thought they wanted. So that that was pretty phenomenal. Karen Fuller, our chief technology director, she and her team are wizards. So with technology, and they are they are up to date, state of the art technology, and make sure that what you're looking for is not going to be obsolete in a semester. So that's real important too. Deadlines, uh, February the 19th. Uh, is the deadline for the spring. If you would like to submit your idea to us, to me, prior to spending time writing your grant, please feel free to do it. We can tell you if we're, if we're aware if it's been done before, uh, approved, denied, something that uh, you know the district is already looking at, what have you. So if you want to do that, please feel free to do that. We do not share your information with anybody else. All that we ask is that you do it in the form of an email. It's just a little bit easier for us to reply back to you, especially if we have to do some research if it's something that was done before, okay? Um, your if your application or your concept includes any modifications to your building, uh, to your campus, that must also have approval in advance. And that's through uh, Mr. Robertson and his off uh, associate superintendent of uh, facility and student of school services. If uh, some things that have been done in the past, the weather bug where they have to go and put the satellite onto the building, things like that. Anything that requires a modification, add to, subtract from, um, that has to seek approval. You just will email Mr. Robertson and he will email you back once you get the affirmative. Also attach that to your grant application, okay? Um, so we want to make sure, oh, also, and it doesn't necessarily just have to be to your building. If you're looking at something that, you know, a garden or a pond or something like that, whatever, birdhouses with cameras on them, that all has, you all have to have approval for that. So uh, please be, be sure and get that information. Also, if you're doing something that um, you think that there may be a potential um, concern to any of your students, uh, please seek the necessary approval. I will give you two examples. Uh, Dory was approved for a grant. It was called Edible Cars, and it was the old soapbox derby kind of thing, but the cars were made out of food. And so, of course, Lori Combs and her team worked with Dory to make sure that all of the food was uh, appropriate, that the releases that were sent home to all of the parents explained quite completely that there would be food so that the parents could notify the school if there were any food allergies and those students could be uh, handled appropriately, still able to participate, but things that would not uh, harm them in any way. Uh, also, if uh, it, uh, Grace England, the pre-K center, they were doing some, um, uh, they received a grant that involved bicycles, some painting of some stuff on parking lots and things of that nature. So Bruce Berry, and his team went out and looked at it from a safety perspective. Uh, was this part of the parking lot that they were looking at safe, no through traffic, uh, what, you know, accessibility, visibility, things of that nature. He uh, submitted an affirmation and they were able to attach that to the grant. So those types of things are very important because first and foremost, 
first and foremost, we want to ensure the safety of our students and our staff. And we want to make sure that whatever is awarded has the capability of, of following through to completion. And so that involves protecting our kids. Okay. All righty. The next thing we want to look at is the grant application itself. You've got a copy of it in your uh, folder. We want, to be, we want to know what type of grant. Is it a classroom grant? Is it a, a department grant, a campus grant, a multi-campus grant? Uh, again, Lead the Spark is only for principals. We do know that principals generally will have a team putting that together, but as far as the Education Foundation is concerned, Lead the Sparks are awarded to the principal, okay? So just keep that in mind. Also give us a grant title. We always like to, to tell people that uh, uh, when you're awarded and uh, we do the press releases that we wanna make sure that your, your grant has a, um, a, a title that is appropriate, but also something that's kind of fun if, if, if that's uh, appropriate and um, not too boring. The amount requested. Be sure that the amount requested on the front page matches the budget request on the back page. Very important. Also, what campus you're from, uh, what grade levels are going to uh, be impacted, your primary contact. You will see on the application that there are areas for more than one person to participate. That's fine. We're, we do not limit the, the number of participants on a grant, but the person in the number one slot is who we contact in the event that we have any questions. And typically that contact will be via email and I will always copy the principal on it. So if I've got a grant review person that is asking me a question and I need to get that answer before we go to full blown uh, grant review, it is very important. And I will typically give you a deadline because I want you to have an opportunity to get that back to me in a timely manner so that I can share it with the grant review committee and they have all the information that they need uh, to make uh, a great decision. And then any additional team members, the subject content area, we want to know what the content areas that are affected in your grant application. This has a lot of reasons, but the primary reason is that we want to make sure that the appropriate program director reads your grant because they are the ones that are going to be um, your cheerleader if it's something that is they want to see in the district that is not currently being done that they can provide as additional facts for support for um, and they can they can keep us in the in the informational loop uh, so be sure and do that. The number of participants, students, teachers, parents, volunteers, sometimes you don't, you don't necessarily know those hard numbers because grants written in the spring are for the fall, okay? So if you can guesstimate the number of parents that will be involved, if any, the number of volunteers, if any, business partners, what have you, uh, the number of students, again, probably with students and teachers, you're gonna be able to get closer to that hard number, but be sure and just put that, get that as close as, as you can and let us know. The next thing that we want under part A grant description is we want a brief synopsis of your grant. I call this a power statement. In our, in our press releases, when we're having to describe our grants, we do not want to say, this grant will fund A, B, C, and D for X, Y, Z campus. We don't want that. We want to know the POW. If you've got a, a member of the community out there reading this press release, they have no idea what's going on at your campus. We want them to be excited about what you're doing for your students. You are the ones, as we tell the kids, doing the extra credit homework to get this, this new innovative equipment project program into your class for your students. We want them to be able to know about it. So put it in a language that is um, uh, understandable by John Q. Citizen, because they're the ones that are probably donating to make it happen and supporting their students that are in those classrooms. And give it to us short, sweet, and to the point, uh, your power statement. Tell, it is what you're trying to, uh, tell us what you're trying to do. Um, we also uh, want, for your purpose, we want you to be very specific. So specific that we have a 75 word limit maximum. If you cannot tell us what it is that you're trying to do in 75 words or less, please have someone who is not in education listen to your concept and listen to them tell you back. Because on our grant review committee, on the foundation side, while we do have some educators, the majority of them are not. 
And so we need them to be able to understand what it is you're trying to do, probably for their students, because many of them have either kids or grandkids in our schools, okay? So what, are your, what is your purpose? What is the instructional purpose, the goals, and the needs? Be very specific. In this case, more is less. Uh, part C, your enrichment and support, 75 word maximum. How does it tie to your campus improvement plan? How is it innovative to what you're doing on your campus? Can you replicate it? Again, sustainability is not a requirement, but a one and done doesn't carry as much weight as something as you have, as if you have the opportunity to do it again for the classes that will follow the ones um, that you're teaching now. What resources are needed? Tell us so that we know what it is that you're going to, to need to make this project a reality and, and make it work for your kids. Curriculum activities, 150 word maximum. What student goals are you going to address? How will the student learning goals be implemented, assessed, and measured? This is not the evaluation part. This is how you're going to measure it during the course of the implementation. Student activities and procedures, what will the student learn? The reason that this is important is because you're gonna outline what it is that you want your students to do as part of this project. On the inside of it, you're going to evaluate it. Did it work? Is it something you would like to see done again? Did it not work? If not, why? Because that way you're going to help somebody else that may come behind you. So those are the types of things that we need. Lastly, on this part is the evaluation, 150 word maximum. The evaluation is probably the most important part after your purpose, but it's also usually the weakest in the grant applications. It is very important for the Education Foundation to know how it is that you intend to evaluate what you've done in very realistic goals. Do not say that 100% of your students are gonna pass every test known to mankind because that's not realistic. If you anticipate having a 10% increase or a 5% increase, that is, that's an increase, that's positive. If you uh, intend to have more par parental involvement, that's a positive, that's an increase. Just be realistic. If you can put numbers to it or percentages to your guesstimate, that's great. If you can't, just tell us what your goal is. Very important, very important part of um, this application. Then we also want to know about your collaboration. While collaboration is not a requirement, we do like to know if you are going to have other people involved, because it expands the scope of your grant. In 75 words or less, just let us know if there will be other folks involved, other schools, teachers, PTOs, community members, what have you. Uh, if you're going to have outside funding or support, is it, is it sustainable? I'll give an example. I'm really stuck on Wonderlick Intermediate tonight, but Wonderlick Intermediate was awarded a grant for Discovery Dome. It's a, an inflatable planetarium. And in and of itself, it's a great idea. But in their grant application, they built in that they were going to allow their uh, feeder schools to also participate in, with it. And so they, they're, that's something that they're working on and making sure that it actually happens. And so that increased the scope. So you give, you give a $25,000 uh, grant to a school and it may impact 16, 1800 kids at the intermediate level, and then you add all the elementary schools that feed into it, that's eight or 900 students per school that you increase the visibility of that one project. And there's life to that project. This isn't a one and done project because it can be shared, it is portable, and um, it just, it works. So those types of things are, are very important is that you, that you be able to tell us um, if it's going to go beyond your classroom. If it's not, that's okay. But if it is, don't leave it out, okay? Also remember that your principal must review and sign each grant application. Because you are submitting this grant application in the name of your campus, your principal has to be aware of it and has to approve it. So please make sure 
that that is done. When you bring your grant application to us, unless you send it by inner office mail, the one thing we will do is we will check your budget to make sure that it's complete and we will make sure that your principal signed it as well as all of the, um, the folks that are uh, on the grant application. So um, your grant must be finalized and awarded to us or upon uh, submitted to us, I apologize, submitted to us uh, by April and then uh, awarded, typically it will be in May. Um, that Those dates change sometimes, okay? Next we're gonna talk about is budget. Uh, before I go to that, do I have any questions? That is correct, yes. And you can actually, and you are encouraged to submit that. If you haven't started writing your grant, go ahead and submit that technology request because some people will decide to write their grant now for the fall and some will hold it for the fall to write for the spring. But once you have that technology approval, you're good to go unless that technology changes within the district, okay? But uh, so I would go ahead and submit that. That just gives them time to check and also check to see if, um, if any new technology is coming out. So the question was about the deadlines for technology, submit by February the 19th. The grant applications are due April the 1st. Any other questions? Okay, great. At this time, I would like to uh, ask Cindy Schrode to come up. Cindy Schrode is um, in the Education Foundation office. She was also a financial secretary for 12 years at Dory, so uh, she knows the budget inside and out, uh, and that is her area of expertise. So, Cindy, if you'd like to come forward. Well, a lot has changed in purchasing since I was a financial secretary, but basically what happens when you're awarded a grant is the money is actually sent to KISD, the check's made out to them, and it's put in a budget account that begins with our grant number budget funds. So we have final approval on everything. But the money's there, it has to be spent exactly like you would any other state district budget funds. You've got to follow the purchasing guidelines, bid vendors have to be used, et cetera, et cetera. Now you librarians, you'll probably be doing your own grants and your own entry, so you'll understand this process. Everyone else will probably want to, will be using their financial secretary. And they're the ones you can go to with questions. Are you using a vendor that's approved? Are they a sole source vendor? That sort of thing. So that's important. You can't just go out and use somebody you know. They've, they've got to be approved and you've got to follow the whole district process. I might can help you out. Your financial secretary is your best bet. And then, of course, purchasing is always available to talk to. But that's kind of how it works. That's where your money sits. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Once the requisitions get entered, the principal will initial off on them, and then they get sent to us, and we do final approval, and it gets sent to purchasing, and then things get ordered. We want to make sure that when you're ordering from a vendor and you get quotes, get a written quote, because remember, if you're awarded in May, maybe you're not ordering it till you get back. So you don't want to make sure your quote is good for a prolonged period of time. You want to make sure that you include your shipping cost and that you don't um, pay tax to anybody. Same thing you would with the district stuff. We want you to leave a little bit of wiggle room in your funds. And the one way we suggest doing this, we like for you to round up. We don't want to award a grant for $4,754. We want it rounded up. Um, and that also gives you a little wiggle room and you can put it under you know, miscellaneous. And what you will do is on your budget form that's in your grant package, you'll break out your budget by general supplies, reading material, professional services, transportation, whatever it happens to be, your rough amounts that you think it's gonna cost. If you're doing all reading material, then you'll just say reading material. And the reason this is important is because I have to come up with the budget and say where all this money goes and break out the amounts and send it up to accounting before you even know whether or not you're getting the grant. And I can't call you and ask you. So just be, you know, fairly specific because that helps. It's not that the money can't be moved later. It just, you have to do a BCR and it takes a little longer for you to have access to your funds. Um, if you're awarded the grants this spring, the funds will have to be encumbered by December 1st. And then you'll write your review the following May, I think it is. But anyway, that's, that's all in the packet there. Okay, a lot of information. One of the things that uh, we did want to point out to you is that um, 
bullets are okay. You do not have to write narratives for uh, your grant application. If bullets work better for you to, to get your point across, especially your activities, you just want to bullet them out, that's fine. That is not a problem at all. Whatever works best for you. Typically, we do not encourage attachments to a grant application. Uh, because it's just something else that we have to copy and go through. We hope that you're able to get that information uh, expressed in your grant application uh, portion. Now, if there is something that's really unique or unusual where you feel like you have to uh, provide an attachment, that's okay. I'll give you an example. Uh, the NASA space program. Uh, there was a week-long uh, curriculum that was laid out, four days of a curriculum at the school campus level. Fifth day was a trip to NASA. It's already been done. It's not innovative anymore. But um, they wanted to be able to show the activities that were already planned out for those days because every day had a theme. And so, of course, that was attached because that was something that would be very uh, interesting and uh, important to the curriculum, to uh, the curriculum component to the, um, the kick project program director, sorry, program director. So we want to make sure that the, if there is something that you just think is really vital to the program directors, please go ahead and in include that. Beware of acronyms. As I said earlier, a lot of the uh, program directors, the, the um, grant review committee people from the foundation are not educators. So when you use acronyms that they do not understand, you've lost them in that part of your communication. So please do. If you want to give it out, you know, spell it out, acronym it, and then use it the rest of the way, that's no problem. Please do that. Um, we just want to make sure that you have the best opportunity possible. Please save a copy of your grant application. I can't tell you, every time that we go through a round of grants, somebody will call and say, I want a grant. Do you have a copy of it? Sure, no problem. But but we just want to make sure that you you got what you need. Um, is there anybody in here that's a campus champion by chance? Yay! Congratulations! Yay! We've got a couple. Super. We appreciate what you do. Uh, it's very very important to the foundation. This is our second year of campus champions, and I can tell you that everything connected to grants has increased because of the communication that is going from our campus champions to the staff at their campus. So we're very, very grateful about that. In your packet, we have uh, all of our contact information, places where you can go on the website and see uh, what, uh, anything that you need from the grant application, the guidelines, uh, things to avoid. Uh, also, when you're submitting your grant application, please don't staple it, put it in a folder or anything like that. Just put a little binder clip on it and bring it to us. Or if you want to send it in our office mail, that's all right too. Just allow yourself enough time so that it, it's there to us before the deadline uh, because we have to make copies of it. We're still a little archaic in that regard, but we do have to make some copies of it so it's just easier for not having to take it out of something uh, to make it happen. Um, we're just very excited to have all of you here. We appreciate everything you do for your students. Uh, and going above and beyond for them. Uh, it's very important to us and for the, the volunteer board of directors who make this happen, uh, it's very important to them because they're going out and raising about $250,000 a year to have 150,000 of it go into grants. We have other projects that are funded also, but uh, to set aside $150,000 for grants every year. They don't just raise it every couple of years, it's every year. So it's very important for them to see what, you're, what each of you are doing uh, to go above and beyond for your kids. So for that, we're extremely, extremely grateful. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. What the question was is for an application directed uh, for special needs students, would the research be, uh, would it be necessary to attach the research to support it? You could probably provide that information in, um, in a very short, specific statement. And then if you wanted to provide a web link that they could go to, if it is something, um, and I will give you an example here, for Brill's library transformation, which was for their whole campus, they had some furniture that we had never heard of before at the foundation level. And so they provided some pictures of that so that we knew what the product was. They were very clear in what they were going to do with it, 
but in order for us to fully understand the product, they did attach a, a couple of documents for that. Um, and as a result, we ended up going to a vendor fair and looking at all the furniture so we could become more acclimated to it. But I would say try to put it in your application. If you feel that it's just something absolutely near, uh, necessary, then include it. Um, but just try to get as much as you can inside the grant application itself, okay? We will, at the end of, of uh, the next presentation, be available for questions and everything. So if you think of anything, just keep it. If you want to ask any questions while uh, during the next program, please feel free to do this because we want to make sure that you get the information that you need. One of the questions that we had uh, during the break was about the submission for uh, technology approval. You just have to submit your uh, request about technology by February the 19th. So you can send your email or your request form by February the 19th. Once you get that answer back and you write your grant application, you just attach that to it. The grant application is due to us by April the 1st. So I just wanted to clarify that note. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate to ask. Go ahead. The question was, if you want to add other people to your grant application who did not attend the workshop, one of the things from our capstone project was we eliminated the requirement to attend the workshop. Uh, while we do encourage it, it is no longer a requirement. So you can add as many people as you want, but we just want to make sure that the number one slot is the, the primary contact. Okay, great. Thank you for the question. After uh, Lynn's presentation, we will have information up on the website so you'll be able to see it in the room where you can go and get any other information that you need. But again, we want to answer your questions here today. Uh, right now, I have the honor and privilege of introducing Lynn Dozier. She is uh, a former educator in Klein ISD. She spent nearly 30 years at Klein Forest and has uh, brought uh, several of her former students uh, at, to be involved with the foundation, whether on our board or helping us in fundraising or other activities. So she's extremely committed, not only to Klein Forest, but uh, to Klein District as a whole. I do have to say, that uh, Lynn uh, was the lead of the grant writing team at Climb Forest, and to date, Climb Forest High School has won more grants from the Education Foundation than any other campus in this district, and they're at over $100,000 in grants. So, yeah. And I will tell you that the, the thing that was important about that is that at the time, there were principals that really um, understood the need and the importance to their campus and they took that need and developed a team that could seek out the resources that could help them with the funding they needed and the education foundation was just one but uh, they were very good at it so uh, we've asked lynn to come and help us she now sits on the uh, foundation board uh, she's retired from the district she's just working for the district with no pay now so <laughs> we, we really appreciate that um, but at this time, please uh, help me welcome Lynn Dozier, who will talk about uh, writing a great grant application. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you all for coming. It's good to see some old friends and meet some new friends. Um, records are made to be broken, okay? So we're looking to see which school is going to be the one to break the Klein Forest record. Uh, let me just say that um, I came, retired 2011. This is my fifth year of retirement. Um, and the first time that I rode the Celebration Express as a member of the board of directors, I cried the entire trip. Uh, I mean, I just, I, the emotion of being in the schools and seeing the children and the teachers and their excitement was just more than I could handle. Um, and I told people afterwards, they said, well, so what do you think about it? I said, well, you know what? I've left the forest, so now I can see the trees. <laughs> and I think that's pretty cool. So I have three purposes here to help you all today. One is to help you, give you some ideas about how to develop projects and how to assess those projects, uh, how to write each one of the sections with some samples and some models that we can use, and then finally some tips on revising and editing. And please, any time that you know, you've got a question, let me know. Uh, I'm, I'm good to, to 
break up and, and answer your, respond to your questions. First of all, let's talk about the, the audience for the people, or the people who are going to be reading your grants. The curriculum team that from, from KIC, they understand the best practices in the curriculum areas. So they know what works and what's good research-based uh, ideas. The people from the foundation, and I think our team is about six people now, who will also be reading the grants, they want to see how the money they will be awarding will impact children. They want to be able to have a picture in their heads of what's uh, going to happen with the kids when they get the money. And you need to remember they have a limited time to evaluate your grant, and that's why we have uh, word uh, limits on so many of the uh, parts of the grant because we know that it takes a limited a little bit of time to do that and we want to be able to get through them. All right, let's talk about first of all about balancing instruction curriculum and evaluation. Uh, I, this actually comes from a staff development that I did in Klein ISD several years ago before I retired. First of all the obje objectives. What are the kids going to learn? Okay, and that's going to be part of something you're going to want to think about. Uh, they can be TEKS objectives, but they can be other things too. You know, the soft skills, you know, like learning to work in a team and showing initiative and problem solving. And all of those things that business people really are interested in, in seeing being developed in, in kids today. How the kids will learn. What are the activities? that we can see the youngsters doing as they, they use, utilize the funds that the foundation has provided for them. And then last, how are you going to evaluate it? And as Cindy indicated earlier, this is sometimes difficult to, to evaluate. So I've kind of provided some things that I think might help you as well on that. And again, this comes from a staff development that I printed in, um, or that I uh, proposed in, in Klein a few years ago. Traditional assessments are the true, false, matching, multiple choice, fill in the blanks, you all understand that. The, the STAR test, the EOC, measures a, one, a snapshot of what they're going to achieve on a certain day, what they understand on a certain day. The SAT, ACT, all of those are comparing the kids to other, other areas. So kind of keep that in mind. How are the, what are the kids going to be learning that will provide them for some of the other experiences that they're going to have to face? Um, the authentic assessments are on the right. Look at all of the things that you can do to assess whether a child is learning besides just give them a test. Um, you can observe, and let me say that I think that's one of the key things is to observe. When I was teaching, I used to have a, like a coach I had um, my class rolls on a clipboard, and I would walk around, and if I told the kids I wanted to see a full page of writing on something, I would walk around, and I would take that clipboard and put a little check mark by it. Observation, seeing what the kids are doing. That's an important part of your ro a role as a professional, I think. Um, essays, oral presentations, summaries, reports, journals, short answers, all of those things. Keeping their learning in a portfolio. Um, Fran Ditta, the assistant, super, assistant superintendent, assistant principal, I gave her a promotion, didn't I? She was so good in Austin, I just gave her a promotion. Uh, Fran Ditta is a principal, assistant principal at Klein Oak, and she and I presented some information this past weekend on portfolios that they're using at Klein Oak High School, a result of a grant that we've had. So keep, keep in mind all of those things. So does that kind of help you all to see? This gives, this gives the opportunity for the foundation directors to see, okay, this child is going to be able to keep a journal, and we'll be able to see that journal if we walk into that classroom. Okay? Okay. Um, we're going to kind of go over some criteria for the grant, and I'm going to ask you all to look in and pull out this sheet, if you will. And I'm going to go over a couple things with you. Um, this was a grant written at Klein Forest called the Physics of Safe Evacuations. And the grant committee consisted of the physics teacher, the nurse, the nurse on staff, and also our criminal justice people. And they started talking about it, and I said, if you can put this grant into words that I understand, it'll probably win. 
because it was a very complicated grant. And so what I did for this as a model for you all is to put the criteria for the grant in the box. Who, what, this is a synopsis. Who, what, what are you, who will read it? Who, what are the, the goals? What, what, where, when, how, why? That's a good journalistic uh, model for writing a synopsis. It's a power statement, as Cindy said, and those statements that we can use if we want to put a, out a news release on it. So basically on the right, you'll see the comments where I highlighted for you all where you can find that information, the part of the grant that answers the question of, I'm going to move my glasses down here, of the title, clearly identifies who will benefit, why the grant is needed. Okay? I'll give you a minute to kind of review that and see if you have any questions. This is the comment section on the grammar checker. How many of you have used that, the grammar style checker on your computers? Uh, the comment section can be very, very helpful to identify those things. Okay, now in order to kind of save time and, and do justice to the time you have, I'm gonna call your attention down to the reading level and the word count that was provided by the grammar checker. This uh, synopsis has 156 words. The technical um, requirement was 150, and they went six over. We don't sit and count your words, but we know, you know, we can tell if it's gonna be really, really close to that. And a little bit later, I'll show you how to edit some of those words to get them out to make it a little bit shorter. I also want you to notice the reading level, 14.1. That means that um, on the Flesh Kincaid reading scale that the, the reader of that grant should be a college reader. And I'm pointing that out to you, 14.1 would be what, sophomore college? I'm pointing that out to you all because writing short does not necessarily mean that you're writing for a lower level audience. It really, it really doesn't. It means that you sometimes have gotten out of some of the, eliminated some of the extra words, and so it really does take a good reader to read it. Okay, is that clear to everybody? All right. The next one is a section on the instructional purpose, goals, and needs. The evaluation criteria, there are two for this section uh, that we look at. Does the part of the grant state the goals and the purpose clearly? Does it address specific instructional needs? I'm gonna give you a minute or two, and what I would like for you to do is to read that, that passage on the instructional purpose, goals, and needs, and put a one in the margin where you think that it states the goal and the purpose. You may wanna use, like I did, a little bracket around it, and put a two where you think that it addresses the specific instructional needs. Okay, do you see how the writer was able to do that with a minimum amount of words? Again, the writer went over just a little bit. You know, there are a lot of uh, pretty good vocabulary words in there. And when you're determining reading levels, that's a whole other subject, but when you're determining reading levels, <laughs> that is based on the number of syllables that a word might have. So the trick will be to get out the little words so that you can put the important words in it, okay? The next part of the grant is the educational enrichment and support. The evaluation criteria that we use are that it improves the student learning, is broadly applicable, applicable and replicable, replicable, you did that much better than I did, Cindy. Utilizes the materials in new and creative or different ways. Benefits a large number of students or a special population that needs extra support. So I'll give you a minute or two, and again, in the margin or underline, see if you can identify where the writers of this grant met those criteria. You can use a one, a two, and a three. You can underline whatever's convenient for you. Is that helpful, everybody? And you see that I'm kind of giving you a minimum amount of time because we need to be able to go through and say, okay, they did this, they did this, they did this pretty quickly. 
Okay? If you'll turn the page, the next one is Part D, the curriculum methods, activities, and procedures. The evaluation criteria that the grant review committee will be using is that it, in, it includes specific student activities, it connects the activities to the district goals and objectives, and engages students. Cindy mentioned that you use bullets, we use, they use numbers on this, and you can see how it um, goes right through what the kids will be doing. And I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit of something different with this. Will you underline the first word of each one of those numbered statements? Okay, here's an English teacher. <laughs> what do you notice? They are active verbs, that's exactly right. Uh, it gives uh, the, the readers a clear picture of exactly what they can see the kids doing, okay? Okay, the same thing on the evaluation and the follow-up plan. Let's take a little bit of time and go over that as well. Underline the first word. What do you discover? I notice all the things that the kids can do. Look at that. They can conduct interviews, write, it, write reports, compare loads, produce a video, prepare and annotate a bibliography, design and use. They can look at, look at all those things that come underneath the authentic assessments. Last one, the school and community involvement. Simple criteria involves other classes, teachers, campuses, or community members. What I think I'd like for you to do on this one is to put a bracket around every place where it, men where it mentions, the grant mentions a class, a teacher, campus, or community member. Notice that this, par that this section is broken up into several different paragraphs. So you have um, a narrative paragraph on a couple of them, you've got lists and bullets on another, and then you've got shorter paragraphs. Let me say that what we found at Klein Forest really worked is that when you get a team of people, um, I never really wrote any of the grants. I would kind of help with some of the editing. My job was to be a campus champion before we had campus champions, to bring people together. And one of the things that, that I saw that happened over there is that each person on the team wrote a section and then one person edited it. So you've got a clear, person that's working with the language and it sounds like it's written by one one person. I also suggest that you write it all in one font. You know, occasionally, I know you, occasionally we get a grant and there's two or three fonts and it looks real funky, but you know what, it's really hard to read. You know, watch your use of capital letters, punctuation, those things all count. You know, capital letters even in a grant look like they're shouting, you know, just like on a text message. Are, are, you know, in Facebook, so you want to be careful about using those kinds of things. You know, they, they don't want to have to deal with a lot of cute things. So tell them what you got to tell them, and then tell them, and tell them what you told them. Okay? Um, the budget, Cindy has done a good job of going over that with you all. Um, if you have any questions about the budget, don't call me. <laughs> 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 I love to give the money away, you know. I don't like to add it up, but call Cindy and um, either one of our Cindy's, I call them Cindy squared, Cindy to the second power. Call either one of them, they'll be more than happy to answer. The last part is on composition quality. We're not asking for y'all to be polished English teacher writers. I'm not even sure that I'm a polished English teacher writer. I have never in my whole life written anything that I didn't have three or four people look at before I tried to publish it or send it off somewhere. So we do want you to respect the rules of the English language. That makes it easier and facilitates our reading. Uh, we don't really count like a whole bunch of points off on it, but you know, it's kind of like anything else. If there's a spelling area, error, that we might notice that other than what you really said. So do some proofreading on it, okay? Anybody have any questions so far? Let me just say that I think the models that we've, pr that we've provided for you also work with your kids. You know, if you want them to do something, show them what the criteria is before they start to work on it. How are you going to evaluate it? Show them an example of 
what you want them to write or produce. That always helps them as well. Questions, anybody? Oh, I'm going to get out of here quick. <laughs> All right. Now, the last part that I have for you all is uh, some pages to help you edit and revise, to get rid of those unimportant words so that you can get to the meat of it. These are pages from a book that I've written uh, that are the lessons that I used that developed from my classrooms. The first one is, why should I edit passive voice or passive B verbs? It, it answer, starts with a question, gives you an answer. Um, we work with nouns and verbs. They're the most, everything else clumps around nouns and verbs. And then it gives you four techniques to eliminate the B verbs. I think there's a little story that maybe I can share with you on this because we're looking at good time. My son called me up from Texas A&M and he says, Mom, <laughs> my professor keeps telling me I need to get rid of my B verbs. How do I, I don't even know what they are. How am I supposed to get rid of them? So I came up with the four techniques to help my son at Texas A&M get rid of the B verbs. And I have shared those with you all on this handout and also in the pages from the book. Okay, the second one is how do you write tight? Um, to get rid of the little words so that you can get the words the meat is, it, there's a story that I like to share with that. Um, the, I don't know if it's true or not, probably isn't, but it's a good story anyway. Um, there was a big chunk of marble in Michelangelo's backyard and a friend came over and says, what are you gonna do with that, my, that big chunk of marble? And he said, well, he said inside, of that chunk of marble is a beautiful woman. And so he started to polish and chip and take away and move around and sure enough, what, who emerged from it? Venus de Milo. So that's what you're looking at when you're revising and editing is you're chipping away at the extras. And some of these little words that you can get rid of um, is and there and it to and 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 by and his and the, be careful. Um, I just was told recently that on the college admissions essays, that the admissions essays, the, the people who are reading them are much looking much more carefully at how a student uses some of these little words than they are some of the big words. For instance, a dog has a different implication than the dog. So you might want to think about that. Okay. The next page that I hope might help is grammar. It does count. There are only six major errors according to the college board that students really make in their writing. And um, they're the same errors that teachers and businessmen and purchasing managers like my husband make. Um, and so I've given you those six, the overuse of the passive voice. You can see an example of, of the passive voice and then how to correct it. And so hopefully those will help. Again, good grammar helps to speed along the reading. I told my students, the longer it takes me to read your paper, the lower your grade goes. Because I'm getting stymied by some of the things that, that are bothering me. Uh, the last page is the grammar style checker. This may not be currently up to date because you know they change the software on things and all the time, but it'll at least give you a place to start to use the grammar style checker uh, to run it through. Besides having other people write the things uh, read the things and help you with it, run it through the grammar checker. Okay? All right. General writing tips. Use the key words from the prompt in the opening sentences. That one said the purpose of this grant is to, you know, use a key word. Don't repeat the whole thing, but find a key word that helps to keep it on track. You're back on the PowerPoint. Uh, include bullets, numbers when appropriate, change the paragraphs as a visual aid to the readers. One whole synopsis of, you know, without a break, that can be hard to read. 
You know, Henry David Thoreau wrote like that, but that's tough. That's tough. Okay, use consistent fonts, margins, and white space. Write tight, eliminate fillers, overworked adjectives, all adverbs. The old, um, oh, what's the name of the show where the two psychiatrists were brothers? Frazier. Frazier looked at his brother one time and said, adverbs are the sign of a weak mind. Think about it. Run quickly. How many words can you think of that mean the same thing as run quickly? Give me one. We want to use a verb. What? Speed. There, you're a math teacher, right? Okay, I use, that ex I use that excuse with a budget. That works. It works, girl. It works. Okay. Um, speed. Anybody else? There you go. So that's a good word. That's a good word instead of run quickly. Okay. Um, educational jargon and flowery language. We know you love your kids and we know they're beautiful. I see them when I go down to Island Elementary in a mentoring program. We, I know they're, they deserve everything that you can do for them. But we still have money that we have to take care of. So as Cindy also mentioned, the educational jargon, the acronyms, explain those as well. Any questions about that? Tips for titles. These are actual titles from some of the grants that we have funded in the last few years and a few little helps of poetic uh, techniques, V-cubed, voyaging via video conference, puns and wordplay, the easel way to write. Isn't that cool? See, a title can kind of help the reader get a positive vibe for what you're saying anyway. It's important. Um, the Oscar, of course, she mentioned, Cindy mentioned the Wonderlick. Uh, the Oscar stood for Our School Cares About Reading. I still remember that from that title. Uh, metaphor, a statement of fact, the physics of safe evacuations, and that's the one that uh, the team from Klein Forest wrote. Uh, nouns and verbs, avoid adjectives and adverbs. Everything clumps around the nouns and verbs. Keep in mind, the Clyde ISD Education Foundation raises money so we can give it away to you all. Your ideas deserve funding. And we've proven that, I think, with the amount of money that we have shared with teachers over the last few years. Do your homework. You know, find out if there's another school that has an idea that's done similar to that. Look at some of the ideas that have already been funded. Do your homework, do your research. Um, I'm repeating what Cindy said, but a good link to something can be very helpful. Um, don't worry about being clever or cute. Do think about being clear, correct, and concise. The three C's, clear, correct, and concise. I learned those a long time ago and they still work. Write the grant and get it out the door. I will see somebody at the grocery store and say, what happened to that grant? You were at the grant, I was really, really excited about hearing about it and well, I just didn't get it done. Get it done. We'll be waiting for them. Any questions? The question is, if you don't win, do you get another opportunity? Do you get some feedback? And the answer to that question on both cases, yes. You will get a critique back, which, which will tell you why we maybe have n decided not to fund it at that time, and we'll give you some hints about some things that you could do. We, uh, we have a lot of grants submitted, and you know we're limited in the amount that we can fund, although we don't really let that stop us. You know, we want to fund the grants that are submitted to us that are the most deserving. It's a competitive process. But we will help you uh, and give you feedback.